So if you remember back a couple of weeks ago when we were um, continuing in our series of lessons on Jesus the Master Teacher, you might remember we talked about some interactions that Jesus had with Peter. And specifically one of the things that we talked about was the incident where Jesus was walking on the surface of the lake following the boat that his disciples were traveling in and Peter uh, asked to come out with him and was able to duplicate that feat for a period of time until he lost focus and began to sink. This morning I want to look at a lesson that Jesus taught right after that. And it's important that we think about it in that setting because as we often talk about, or at least as I often talk about, when we look at things in scripture, context is, is critical for us to understand things. And oftentimes, when we look at things outside of the context in which they happen, that is to say, what happened immediately before this, who were the people involved, and so forth, sometimes we don't get a clear picture of exactly what's going on or what's being said. We sometimes develop, not necessarily a wrong idea, but an incomplete idea of, of what's going on in a particular situation. And I think that's happened oftentimes with the lesson that we're going to look at this morning. That oftentimes, because we don't see it in the context of everything else that John is writing about, and we're going to look at this this morning from John's account in the, in the sixth chapter of his gospel. If we don't look at it in the context of everything that's going on in John's gospel, it's easy for us to really miss the point, I think, of what Jesus is trying to get across to us here. And the passage that we're going to look at this morning, the lesson that we're looking at this morning, is what we often call Jesus' bread of life sermon. Now, it wasn't really a sermon, it was a conversation that he had, but we often refer to it as the, as the bread of life sermon, because that's sort of the, the key point that Jesus makes. But as I said, it's important that we see the context of this particular teaching. If we go back to the beginning of the 6th chapter of John, before this particular section happens, we, we see the incident that we alluded to in talking about that thing with Peter, that just before that, Jesus had been in a place where he was preaching to a crowd of more than 5,000 people. People who had come out to this relatively isolated place by the lake, and Jesus was presenting a lesson to them. And as the day went on and people got hungry, and the disciples began to say, well, you know, there's all these people here, and you know, there's no food, and what are we going to do? And there was a young boy there that had, a, had brought lunch, had five small barley loaves, what we might think of today as, as biscuits, really, and a couple of fish, you know, sardines, if you want to think about it in that, in that context, that he had brought for his lunch. And Jesus took that small amount of food and using his power over that food fed this huge crowd of more than 5,000 people. And it was just after that that came the incident that we talked about when we talked about Peter that the disciples left that place to cross the lake in a boat and Jesus was following them walking on the surface of the water and when Peter saw him he said Lord ask me to come out to you and Jesus said come on and Peter was able to walk on the surface of the lake toward Jesus until he stopped paying attention to Jesus and started paying more attention to the waves and the wind and took his focus off Jesus and he began to sink at that point. And you remember that Jesus reached out his hand, collected Peter and they both got on the boat and the boat sailed on safely to shore. Now John goes on to tell us what Matthew did not in that account that we read uh, in that lesson a couple of weeks ago, John goes on to tell us what happened immediately after that. And what happened right after that was that the crowd from that previous event followed Jesus and the disciples on foot around the corner of the lake 
to come to the place where they had landed, which was the city of Capernaum. And when Jesus and the disciples got there, they had gone to the synagogue. And Jesus was continuing to teach in that place when this crowd of people arrived on the scene that he had fed the previous day. And so here's John's account. And there's going to be a lot of reading here. Please hang with me. It, it'll, it'll all make sense. Just follow along a, as we go. But John begins the account by saying, When they found him at the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. I want us to stop for a minute here before we go on to the rest of the passage, because again, context is everything. If we're going to really understand what Jesus is about to say, we have to understand what he says right here. And that is that the people who came looking for him came looking for him not because they believed in him on the basis of him having performed a miracle. In fact, many miracles, because we're also told that not only had he fed a whole bunch of people after he preached that sermon, but there were many who were ill in the crowd. And Jesus had healed the sick people that had come to hear his message. So Jesus had done a lot of miraculous things the previous day when they had seen him. But Jesus said, that's not why you're here. You didn't come here because you saw the power of God and believed in me as a result of that. You came because I fed you for free. And you think I might do it again. And he says, here's what I want you to understand. What you ought to be doing is not pursuing food that's going to spoil. You leave bread out, it gets stale. You leave fish out, you know what happens. That's not the food that you really ought to be worrying about. The bread and the fish you got yesterday when I fed all you people. The food you need to be looking for is the food that will get you to eternal life. And that's what I can give you. Far more than bread and fish. And they said essentially, okay, how do we get that? And Jesus' response is to believe in the one that God has sent is to do the work of God. And this whole idea of believing in him, because Jesus is talking about himself as the one God has sent, to believe in Jesus is that food that they are supposed to be pursuing. And we need to see that point if we're going to understand everything else that's about to go on here. So, the next thing that happens is they ask him a question. They say, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So their response to what Jesus just said about them not coming because they saw miraculous power, but because they wanted free me a free meal. They said, well, back in the day, Moses gave us a free meal every day. He gave our ancestors free food. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with us looking for free food? Because that's how Moses connected with the power of God and our ancestors. What are you going to do if you're not going to give us free food? And Jesus says, truly I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you bread from heaven. 
But it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Once again, Jesus makes the point, stop focusing on the food you're going to put in your mouth and fill, fill up your belly with. That's not the food that Moses gave the people that was important. Yes, they got manna every morning and they ate that and it sustained them. But that wasn't what he gave them that was important. Moses gave them food that was more important than that. And that's what I've come to give you. The bread of God is what comes from heaven and gives life to the world. And I want us to keep that thought in our heads because, again, if we don't remember that Jesus said this, we're not going to understand what he's about to say. So then they said, well, sir, give, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I've told you, you've seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. That I shall lose none of all of those he's given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. Jesus says, if you want bread, here it is. If you want bread from heaven, here I am. I'm the bread of life. I am what will enable you to never be hungry or thirsty. And of course here he's not talking about physical hunger and physical thirst. He's talking about spiritual things now. I can provide you a meal. I can provide you sustenance far beyond the bread and fish you got yesterday. Far beyond the bread that Moses provided to the people in the wilderness. I'm a bread that if you partake of it, you'll have eternal life and resurrection in the last day. And then they started to complain. At this, John writes, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? And again, here we have to consider context. Where is Jesus? He's in Capernaum. He's in that area where he grew up, you know, which is not, not far from, from Nazareth in Galilee. So these are his people. These are the people that he grew up with. People, some of them who had known him all of his physical life. And when Jesus says of himself, I've come down from heaven, they're like, wait a second. We know this guy. He grew up with us. His parents are Joseph and Mary over in Nazareth. He's just like us. How is it that he can say, I came down from heaven? And Jesus says to them, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. Notice the next thing he says. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Now that's not a random statement. Jesus is saying that right here, right now, because it's important. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from Him, notice those two things, 
hearing and learning, which is what's involved in teaching. In order for teaching to happen, somebody's got to hear and, and learn from what they've heard. Everyone who's heard the, fa the Father and learned from Him comes to me. In other words, if you really are listening to what God says, Jesus is saying, there's nowhere you can end up but with me. Because God is pushing you to mo toward me and it has been from the very beginning. If you've gone back and read everything that God's ever said to you, from our perspective, what we would call the Old Testament, if you've read everything that God has said to you up to this point, He's pushed you to me. There's nowhere else you can get if you've really been listening. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. And truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. If you really believe in me, Jesus says, you have eternal life. For I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven that anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. I am bread, Jesus says, that if you eat it, you'll live forever. Manna didn't work that way. Manna came in the morning and they ate it and they survived for a day. But eventually, they all died. In fact, if we go back and read the account of that generation that spent those 40 years in the wilderness, every last one of them died before entering the land that God had promised to their descendants with two exceptions, Joshua and Caleb. Every other person who left Egypt as an adult died in that next 40 years. Even though God gave them food every day. All of them died. The food, although miraculously provided, was not in itself miraculous. It was just food. But Jesus says, I'm food. I'm bread. And if you eat me, you'll never die. I am bread that provides life forever. That's a powerful statement. And it's one that they found a little confusing at first. Because John goes on to say then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And of course already now they're off the train. Because they haven't been paying attention to what he said right up until this point. They're listening on the surface. Which is what quite frankly we always do, right? We always kind of listen on the surface of things. And they heard those words, bread and flesh and eat, and they're like, wait a second. How's, how's, how are we going to eat this guy? What's he talking about? And of course they'd missed what he'd said earlier about the words of the prophets, them being taught by God. And that everyone that heard and learned from God came to Jesus. And that he was that which would give them life. They, they, they'd skipped over that entire part of the lesson. Even though we just, we just heard him say it. They'd missed that, that whole thing. Now they're focusing on the surface words and not paying attention to the meaning. Which is why Jesus now says to them, very truly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, 
you have no life in you. Jesus now is going to say, okay, since you've gotten off the train, I'm, I'm going to follow you off. You've gone off on this weird tangent because you weren't paying attention. And so I'm going to follow you down that weird road. I'm going to give you what you think you heard. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. But then he brings it home again. He says, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And in case we as readers don't get the point, notice what John interpolates here. John is basically just sort of let Jesus and these people talk. But notice John, moved by the Holy Spirit, writes another sentence in the middle of Jesus' talk here just to make sure that we as readers haven't gotten off the train. He said this while doing what? While teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. John wants us to focus on the fact that what Jesus is talking about when he talks about bread coming from heaven is the teaching that he is providing, the words that live in him that he has come to bring to the world. That if they're eating everything he's saying, as it were, they're going to live forever. And John throws that sentence in there, not just by accident, but so that we as the reader understand, okay, that's what Jesus is talking about. He's connecting all this to the idea of teaching. Because if we remember how John, at the beginning of his gospel, and again, this is why context is important. Context is not, in this case, just what happened earlier in the chapter, but it's what happened at the very beginning of the book. We had to read all the way from chapter 1 to get to chapter 6. And everything in between has to inform how we understand chapter 6. How does John introduce Jesus at the very beginning of the book? John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he is saying the same thing that John said at the beginning of the book. Jesus is the Word of God. Because how does food work? You take it into yourself. And it becomes part of you. When you eat food, the molecules, the nutrients that are in the food become part of your body. It becomes indistinguishable from the stuff that was there before. You draw from that food that which becomes you in the physical sense. And Jesus is saying that's how God's word works. If you take God's word in, it becomes part of you. That word will enable you to believe in me. And that belief will enable you to live forever. Now on hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? We sometimes misunderstand that, that, that statement on the part of the disciples. We sometimes think that what the disciples are saying is, 
This idea of eating your flesh and drinking your blood, that's, that's, that's weird and difficult. How do, we understand, how do we accept that? That is not what he's talking about. Remember, he only threw that in to get the people who got off the train back on. What's a hard teaching for his disciples is that they got what he was saying. Many in the crowd didn't, and so they're having this argument about how do we eat him. But his disciples understood that what he's really saying is you have to be fully committed and invested in my word. My word has to become part of you completely and fully, just like food you eat becomes fully and completely part of your body. His disciples said, that's a hard thing to do. How can we do that? How can we accept? How can we do what you demand of us. How can we be that fully committed and invested in your words? And Jesus asked them, does that offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. See, he's like, forget the argument about eating flesh and blood. I'm throwing raw meat to the masses there. Because they've already gotten off the train. The flesh is not what you need to be focusing on. It's the spirit that gives life. The words that I have spoken to you they are full of the Spirit and life. What you need to be focusing on every moment, every day, every second that I'm with you is the words that I speak to you. Because that's where the Spirit is. That's where eternal life is. And yet, all this time, last three years, you bunch of guys have been listening to me and some of you are still not yet fully on the train. Some of you do not yet fully believe. Even though you've heard every word I've said. Because Jesus, John said, had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. There's 12 of you here, he's saying, who've heard every word I said over the last three years. And one of you do still doesn't get it. And doesn't get it to the point that he's going to sell me out to my enemies. But if you've really listened to everything I've told you, you have what you need to obtain eternal life. And he says, that's why I told you, no one could come to me unless the Father has enabled them. How does the Father enable? By providing the words that are spirit and life. And you listen and you go where those words take you. From this time, many of his disciples turned back. And no longer followed him. Jesus, you're asking too much. That's too big a commitment, man. To be that invested in your words. I don't know that I can I don't know that I can be in that hard. And Jesus asks the twelve. You don't you don't want to leave too, do you? But notice Peter's answer. Sometimes, and again, we said this a couple of weeks ago, sometimes Peter got himself in trouble by being the first one to jump in, first one to speak, first one to act. But sometimes Peter got it right, and here he does. 
Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter understood everything Jesus had just said. Peter connected the dots. Peter put it all together. He said, yes, Lord, I know, I understand. You're talking about your words. When you're talking about you being the bread of life, you're talking about you providing that which sustains us forever by means of the words that you speak. You have the words of eternal life. And because of those words, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Notice that Peter does not say, Lord, I believe in you because yesterday you and I walked on water together. He does not say, Lord, I believe in you because yesterday me and these other 11 guys handed out five loaves of bread and two fish to 5,000 people. He doesn't say, I believe in you because I've seen all of the miracles you performed. He says, I believe in you, Lord. We believe in you. We know that you're the Holy One of God because of your words. How did John introduce him at the beginning of the book? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the word was God. Peter and the others who believed, believed not because of everything they'd seen, but because of the words that were spirit and life that came out of the mouth of Jesus. And that's what Jesus wanted from everyone all along. But of course... Jesus makes the observation once again, well, I chose the 12 of you, but one of you is a devil. Because one of you has heard everything the rest of them have heard, and he still doesn't get it. He, he's still not on the train. So what do we get out of all of that? Here's why Peter and the others didn't leap off the train into weird land. Because they understood that the metaphor of God's word as food was not a new thing. Back in Ezekiel chapter 3, here's what we read the prophet Ezekiel saying. God said to me, son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. And then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth. And he gave me a scroll to eat. What was a scroll used for in ancient times? That's what you wrote on. Before you had books like we have them. And certainly long before you had, you know, iPads and Kindles and smartphones to read from. You had scrolls. God's word was written on scrolls in ancient times. Ezekiel's told to take the scroll and eat it. And so he does. He says, I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. And he said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as honey in my mouth. What's really going on here with Ezekiel? Ezekiel, I often, I often refer to Ezekiel when, I, when we teach on Ezekiel. I always say Ezekiel is kind of God's visual aid. Because Ezekiel is compelled to do a lot of physical things that sort of act out spiritual lessons. If you read the, the entirety of the book of Ezekiel beginning to end, as some of you did last year when we read through the Bible, you might have noticed that. Ezekiel is called upon by God to sort of do a lot of odd physical tasks. 
And it's not the tasks themselves are important, but it's the fact that those ta tasks sort of emulate spiritual concepts. And here's one of them. He's given a scroll and he's told to eat it and to fill his stomach with it and it gives a sweet taste in his mouth. And we understand, do we not, the symbolism of that. God is saying, Ezekiel, here are my words. Put them in your mouth. Put them in your stomach so they become part of you because that's what happens with the food that we eat. It becomes part of us. Let my word fill you. Let my word become part of you. Let it be a sweet taste in your mouth. And then God says to Ezekiel, Son of man, go now to the people of Israel and do what? Speak my words to them. Ezekiel, now that you've filled yourself with my words, go and fill other people with them. Go share those words with other people. And notice one other thing here before we leave Ezekiel behind. Three times, how does God refer to Ezekiel? Doesn't call him Ezekiel. Doesn't call him by his name. What does he call him? Son of man. Who refers to himself that way in the entirety of the gospel record? Jesus, does he not refer to himself as the son of man? Jesus is calling back to Ezekiel. And Peter and the other disciples had, had, had been taught this. They, they'd read this passage or had been taught it by rabbis. And they made that connection. They understood, okay, there's the connection between words and food. Coming from the Son of Man. So... That's why Peter and the others got it. Because they put Jesus' words into the context of everything else that they've been taught. Once again, it's like context is so important. Can't understand this without understanding everything else. But that's why they got it. So here's the food to take home. Point number one, Jesus is the word of God. John introduces him that way at the very beginning of the gospel. In the beginning was the word. That word, John says in the 14th verse of that first chapter, became flesh. That's why Jesus brings up the flesh thing. Because he is now the word of God embodied in human form. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. John says in John 1.14. Then Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Those two, connect, those two concepts are not unrelated. They are to be understood together. John puts these things together for a reason. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the bread of life, came from heaven so that we might live forever. But what do we have to do for that bread to get us to eternal life? We have to consume it. That's what he talks about eating my flesh. He's not talking about that in any kind of literal sense. He's saying, if I am the word, you have to consume me. Like you would consume bread. And just like the bread you eat becomes part of you, if you eat of me, the word of God, that word becomes part of you and that's how you get to eternal life. Because it is through that word that we believe unto eternal life. If we consume the bread, Jesus says, it becomes part of us. And that word, Jesus reminded the apostles, contains spirit and life. The bottom line of the whole lesson is this. The word of God and the bread of life are one and the same. Jesus is both of those things. And those two concepts are not unrelated. 
when John at John 1 1 writes, In the beginning was the Word, he knows that in chapter 6 he's going to be writing about Jesus talking about the bread of life. And he's assuming we've read the book from beginning to end and that when we get to chapter 6, we don't forget chapter 1. And that we're able to connect the dots. Even as Peter and the others were able to connect the dots, oh yeah, I remember that time when the rabbi taught taught us about Ezekiel and talked about him eating the scroll and the word was in his stomach, was in his mouth, and then he went out and preached the word. So for us, what does this mean? If we understand that Jesus is the word of God, and we understand that Jesus is the bread of life, which is intended to sustain us toward eternal life, We need to be eating the Word all the time. Just like we eat physical food all the time to sustain our physical bodies. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews the fourth chapter, the twelfth verse, says the Word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates, he says, even to the division of joints and marrow and soul and spirit. The word of God is intended to get into us. He concludes that thought by saying it judges the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That's how deeply we are supposed to be embedding God's word in us and letting it live in us. But remember it is not an it It is a he. In the beginning was the word. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is he who called himself the bread of life. The words that are in that book or the words that appear by the wonders of modern technology on your tablet, on your smartphone, on your Kindle. Those words are not just words. They are spirit and life. When you read God's word, you are interfacing with him who is the embodiment of God's word. And you need to eat him as eagerly as you eat the food that hits your table every day. Because just like that food, that bread, sustains your physical body, that word is intended to sustain your spirit unto eternal life. If you truly let it fill you and cause you to believe in Him who is the Word of God and the bread of life. We can get it, yes, why these were hard things for that audience to grasp. Hard for us, even with all we know, to get our heads around it. But simple once we get it, yes? Not difficult once we understand the concept. Just like we eat bread and it becomes part of our physical body, we are to eat the word and let it become part of our spirit and sustain us to eternal life. That's what Jesus was trying to tell this audience. And the ones that weren't willing to get their heads around that decided they didn't want to follow him anymore. But the ones who got it, like Peter, said, Lord, we can't go anywhere else. You have the words of eternal life. And because of those words, we believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Eat the Word this week. Spend time eating the Word this week. You don't have to engulf the whole thing all at once. Just like you don't have to eat the whole loaf of bread all at once. Just find a bite or two. 
but chew, it, chew on that bite. Let it be that sweet taste in your mouth like it was for Ezekiel. Let it fill your spiritual belly. Ruminate on it. Let it become part of you. And when you've gotten that bite down, bite some more. Because that's how we believe. The more we eat that word, the more we know him who is the word. And it is he upon whom we depend to get us to eternal life.